Good Monday afternoon, guys. My name is Jerry Miller, and welcome to the I Love Seville show. Thank you kindly for joining us. We are live in Charlottesville, the Commonwealth, the country, and the world right here on the I Love Seville network. And there is so much, so much that we need to cover on the Monday edition of this program. Last week's five shows were scintillating, sensational, authentic, raw, honest. We offered both sides of this mask topic and how it pertains to Generation Alpha, our children. And we tried, and I thought we did a fantastic job of offering perspective on both sides of the fence. We did it with three doctors, Dr. Holland of UVA, Dr. Vergalis of UVA, Dr. Wolf of Pediatric and Associates. We did it with a Commonwealth's attorney, Jim Hingley, who we have a lot of respect for. We did it with parents on either side, including Kelly Jackson, Brittany, and Cameron Gray. Now, today I want to offer some follow-up from last week's programming content. We'll also talk Ix Park and this property that's been listed for sale. We were the first to let you know that the city of Charlottesville is 10.2 square miles. The acreage at Ix Park is the most important acreage left to be developed in the city of Charlottesville. I'll say that again. The acreage at Ix Park is the most important acreage left to be developed in the city of Charlottesville. We will compare and contrast Ix to other parcels that have traded within the last handful of months. And I will compare and contrast it to these other parcels to offer a comp, a comparison for you to determine if this $84 million asking price is outlandish or realistic. I'll ask this very straightforward question. Did Ludwig Kutner and Alan Kajin handle the listing of this property appropriately? Were they straightforward, realistic, honest, and mindful of the impact and influence they have in this community? We will break some more news on this network about more businesses that are either closing or for sale. Once these topics are covered on this program, they will then head to the traditional media cycle as those outlets stream and watch this content for content of their own. We understand the influence and the impact in this community and the reach that we have here, and we take it seriously, extremely seriously. And I want to start first on a follow-up on what this network showcased and covered Monday through Friday of last week. The masking in schools topic is as authentic and as passionate and as emotional and as real a topic as we will have in Virginia today. If you can think of one topic in the Commonwealth, in Central Virginia, in the city of Charlottesville, in Albemarle County, 
that is more divisive, please let me know and please put it on the feed. Have you noticed that affordable housing has taken a back seat to COVID mitigation, COVID, man COVID management, and masking? Since this pandemic has hit Central Virginia, the other hot button topic, affordable housing, is not even sitting shotgun to COVID. It's not even in the back seat to COVID. It's in like the trunk of the car compared to COVID that is driving our mindset and our news cycle. It's not affordable housing that's driving the news cycle, it's COVID. You got a governor in office that pulled the mandate as he promised. He campaigned for this. He literally campaigned for this and said, if you elect me, I will do this. And then he did it. That's literally what happened. Last week, I understood the importance of the topic. Hell, at my house, it's a topic of friction between my wife and I and our son. That's why we offered the perspective from Commonwealth's attorney side, doctors at UVA, advocacy of toolkit, return for normal, urgency of normal. Dr. Wolf, pediatric associates, stay masked through the end of second semester, she says. From the parent side of either side of this coin, private school parent, public school parents, parents for pro-mask in schools, parents for opposition of mask in schools. All that content is on ilovesebill.com or wherever you catch your platform, wherever you, wherever you watch or listen to your podcasts. This is my perspective that I'm gonna relay to you. And then we'll head to Ix Park. I'm gonna spend 90 seconds on this and then go to Ix Park. And we'll compare and contrast Ix Park to Fashion Square Mall to the Ivy Square Shopping Center. We'll compare and contrast Ix to other parcels of importance in the city of Charlottesville. We'll ask the future of Ix and did the owners of Ix handle the listing of this property correctly. And we'll also identify a couple of businesses that are closing and or are for sale today on the show. First and foremost, Let's do the flip book of what transpired with masking in schools. In 2021, we had one of the most contested, divisive, engaging governor's races in Virginia as we've ever had. McAuliffe, Yunkin, Yunkin, McAuliffe. Virginians by a 2.2% margin, elected Glenn Youngkin into office. Youngkin captured the red Republican vote while appealing to the centrist, moderate, suburban, soccer mom voter that wanted, in large part, more influence or say of their children and what they were doing in schools. Everything I just said was fact, 100% fact. Yunkin promised Virginians, if you vote me into office, I will empower parents with education, with curriculum, and with COVID mitigation, specifically mass. Yunkin won. One of the first things he did, if not the first thing, was follow through on these mitigation promises and empowering parents. Now you can make this argument and it's absolutely reasonable. When Yunkin was campaigning COVID was not at its peak impact from an Omicron spread standpoint. That is a fair statement. 
2021, as Youngkin was trying to win this election, COVID was not nearly as contagious. The Omicron variant had not reared its hideous head. We often badger in battle. We often badger and berate politicians by not following through on promises on the campaign trail. And we call them two-faced liars and speaking out of either side of their mouths when they do this. Today, in January of 2022, we have a politician in Yunkin that followed through on his campaign foundation, on his promises. And instead of saying he's speaking on both sides, out, speaking out of both sides of his mouth, or calling him a liar, he instead is being berated, battered, and battled for damning the health and safety of children, administrators, teachers, and frontline workers in schools. It's a no-win situation, not only for the governor, but for us. For us, especially moms and dads. You read the news this morning, and now a new variant has reared its hideous head. An Omicron subvariant that's one and a half times more contagious than Omicron, which was way more contagious than Delta, which was way more contagious than COVID. The variants morph. And they, like amphibians or cheetahs trying to survive in the wild, their spotted coach change and adapt to vaccinations. I've said this so many times on this program. Parents on either side of the fence, and I've said there's three groups. There's the group that is mask all the way no matter what. Mask up, mask up, do it no matter what. There's the parents that want the choice to mask their kids or not. And then there's the parents that don't want the mask returned to normal completely right now. Those are the three groups. And I fall in that group of parent choice. All three groups have one thing in common. They're coming from and assessing this pandemic from what's best for my kid. That's, we all have that in common, what's best for my kid. We want what's best for our kid. It's our number one tendency as mama bears and papa bears, what's best for our kid. It's our number one tendency. We all have that foundation of those three groups. That's how we're going about it. I've said I want the choice. And guess what? As a parent who, if given the choice, and at our school we are given the choice, we would still choose, especially because of my wife's influence in our family, to mask our kid and send him to school with a mask on. That's how important it is to her. And... I want to emphasize this. We're seeing democracy, whether we like it or not, and some despise it, and some are in favor of it, but democracy literally is transpiring before our eyes. 
a governor won on a platform associated with mitigation strategies. Virginians voted him into office. That's democracy. Democracy. He's following through on what he campaigned for and putting it into practice through policy. That's democracy. Democracy. School boards in central Virginia, Greene County, Orange County, Fluvanna County, Louisa County, Augusta County, Madison County, school boards all over central Virginia are voting Sometimes in three, two fashions. Sometimes in three, two fashions that lead to the resignation of school board members who opposed what they voted against. They resigned. Greene County, that happened. But good night. It's democracy. Democracy at the state commonwealth level and democracy at the local school board level. That's democracy. What's the saying, Judah? Judah Woodcower is our fabulous director. You can't have your cake and eat it too. That is the saying. You can't have your cake and eat it too. I'm not sure you how that can't applies, but... be yay. Northrum used his governor's power to mandate masks in schools. That's democracy. And then you can't say, Yunkin used his governor's powers to pull the mandate. That's dangerous. Both are cause and effects. of voting for someone in a booth. And how you influence policy and determine the outcomes you want is by voting for someone in a booth. It's not sending nasty messages to people on social media, creating threads on Twitter that the same 19 people read and respond to every time you do one. It's by voting. And I'm going to close with this. Before I get to X, the masking in schools topic is going to unfortunately get nastier and uglier and more heated before it gets more reasonable, pleasant, and lukewarm. We should prepare ourselves for that. That's the nature of what is undoubtedly the most divisive topic in Virginia today. Welcome Pennsylvania to the program. Tennessee, Maryland, folks in Lynchburg, Arlington, Richmond, Short Pump, Crozet, Albemarle, Orange, Nelson, Louisa, Green, Waynesboro, Martinsville, Charlotte, our friends who watch in Wyoming, 
many doctors at the university, and professors on grounds to the program. This is the I Love Seville show, and my name is Jerry Miller. And I'm gonna now go to the next topic on today's program. And the next topic is a piece of news that we broke on Thursday afternoon. Actually, it was Thursday morning during Today e Manana, a fantastic show on this network. A piece of news that then became part of the traditional news cycle. Ix Park, as we explain first to you, is for sale for $83,974,044. An asking price of $4,806,757 per acre. A grand total of 17.47 acres. The listing clearly states, and the listing is posted on ilovesevil.com, on our I Love Seville Instagram, and on all our I Love Seville social media platforms. The listing clearly states that the deal is contingent on the leases in play with the businesses at Ix Park, and there are many of them. Businesses we adore. I'm going to try to ask these questions. Is the $84 million an appropriate asking price for this piece of real estate? I'm going to try to ask this question. What's the future for Ix Park? I'm going to try to answer this question. Answer, not ask. I'm going to try to answer this question. Ix Park versus Ivy Square Shopping Center, which the University of Virginia Foundation purchased. We were the first to let you know about that. Versus Fashion Square Mall which Richard Hewitt purchased. We're gonna compare and contrast X to Ivy Square to Fashion Square. And then I'm gonna to try to answer this. Did Alan Kajin and Ludwig Kutner handle the listing of this piece of property in straightforward, honest, and above the board fashion? We will then break some more news, and I'll give you a tidbit now. Freestyle is closing after 26 years of proudly serving this community. Yes, Freestyle, the outdoor store, and Great Harvest Bakery behind Seville Coffee and Keith Woodard's shopping development is for sale. I have those details for you. First X, $84 million. Jeez, there is sticker shock when you hear a number like $84 million, isn't there? I mean, immediately you hear $84 million or you read it on I Love Seville Instagram and you're like, Good Lord, that's an astronomical number. They'll never get 84 million. And then I caution and offer comps. And then I try to get to the reasoning and the thinking behind the 84 million. And you'd be surprised, perhaps 84 million is in the ballpark. Let's put our thinking caps on and use data. Ivy Square Shopping Center was purchased by the University of Virginia Foundation. The University of Virginia Foundation paid $20 million for Ivy Square Shopping Center. That's the shopping center that's home to Foods of All Nations and an, an eclectic mix of merchants on Ivy Road. The University of Virginia Pound Foundation paid $20 million for Ivy Square Shopping Center, which is comprised of 2.77 acres. I will give you that number again. UVA Foundation paid $20 million for 2.77 acres that we call Ivy Square Shopping Center. Please write that down and remember it. Please consider this. Richard Hewitt on the steps of the courthouse about a block and a half from this building, from this studio in the city of Charlottesville. Richard Hewitt purchased two parcels of Fashion Square Mall. First, he purchased the J.C. Penney site for four and a half million dollars in September of 2020. Then, in July of 2021, not even a year later, Richard Hewitt bought the remaining portion of Fashion Square Mall from Washington Prime Group for twenty million two hundred thousand dollars. So, in a nutshell, Richard Hewitt for a combined. 
$700,000. I will give it that number to you again. Richard Hewitt for a combined $24,700,000 purchased Fashion Square Mall in a couple of deals. And that undoubtedly is a copper comparable for X. So you have two deals that have closed that I've, I, that I've identified as comparables or comps for X. Now before I answer this question, is this a good price, I need to give you more context. Last week, city council in a closed door work, working session, basically a masterminding session for council, they asked how are we going to get to a, a, a budget for this coming fiscal year that can accommodate all the projects that we have on our horizon, like school reconfiguration specifically? And they said, we need to get green light from Richmond to do a sales tax uptick in the city of Charlottesville. And then once, remember, we're in a Dillon rule state where Richmond's calling a lot of the shots for the, ju the jurisdictions. If Richmond greenlights this sales tax uptick for the city of Charlottesville, we then have to do a referendum in the city of Charlottesville for voters to see if they will approve a sales tax uptick. Richmond said, not so fast, my friends, in the words of Lee Corso last week. So now council is left with this decision. Do we uptick real estate taxes 13 cents or more, which is a sizable uptick, to generate incremental revenue to help with projects like affordable housing and school reconfiguration? So here we are in a climate, my friends, viewers and listeners. We're in a climate where five people in a closed door work session are brainstorming the potential for massive real estate tax increases. And they need to real estate tax increase our jurisdiction we call the city of Charlottesville because they wanna do things that are important to people in the city like school reconfiguration like affordable housing. You have Alan Kajin and Ludwig Kutner who own a boatload of real estate in the city. Please check your phone there, Judah. You also have Alan Kajin and Ludwig Kutner, who are no spring chickens. These are gentlemen well over 65 years old. So let's just use common sense, the eye test, and think about this rationally and reasonably. The city of Charlottesville has already raised assessments on real estate this year. The city of Charlottesville's main source of revenue for its jurisdiction is money tied to real estate. The city of Charlottesville is feeling pressure from people in the community to do school reconfiguration at 74 to $100 million in costs over a few year period of time. The city of Charlottesville just struck out potentially when Richmond said we ain't gonna, the delegates, we're not gonna green light sales tax increases in this, for this jurisdiction. Five people, city councilors, in a closed door session, 
are trying to figure out how to keep school reconfiguration and affordable housing a reality. So they're thinking about a massive increase in real estate taxes. You got two dudes that aren't young in Kajin and Kootner that own a 17 and a half acre parcel that's taxed currently at the clip of 20 million. Excuse me, it's assessed at 20 million. Last year, the two properties assessed just shy of $20 million. Kootner and Kajin have already petitioned in a number of occasions the lowering of that tax exposure for X, and they leveraged the fact that it is a public utility, a park that is philanthropic and charitable in nature for the betterment of the community. From my standpoint, and I respect you, Alan Kajin, you know I do, and Ludwig Kutner, I respect you as well, and I know you listen to this program, especially you, Alan. I know you do. We've interacted about stuff. We've talked on this show on a number of occasions, and Ludwig, you know I have respect for you. You know I do. You know I do. Whenever we talk, it's pleasant. I, I very much respect both you guys. I'm going to say this very straightforwardly, and, I, and I, no one who listens or watches this program can ever say that he does not say stuff he doesn't believe in. I say stuff that I believe in regardless of it stinging or, 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 or being unpopular, okay? And to, 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 to voice your opinion like this, like I do, you have to have the thickest of thick skin because you receive nastiness from people who disagree with you, and that's okay, I get it. It's part of the gig. But Ludwig and Allen, and this is very straightforward to you, for you guys to petition, for you guys to, 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 to say that a, a $20 million assessment, that your tax exposure associated with Ix Park is not fair to you, and your bottom lines, because this is a public utility, a park that's used for charitable functions, for you guys to make that statement, and you guys have put reasonable arguments in play for that. And Susan Crischel does a hell of a job of arguing that as an attorney herself. She is talented, she is dynamic, and she knows how to present things in very intelligent fashion. Susan, I sincerely mean that about you, Susan. But for you to say that, we shouldn't be taxed at this clip for this property. And then to go in very clandestine nature, list this property. And if I had not have put this on people's radar, this probably would be on the DL right now and no one would know about this $84 million listing. I just want you to realize that. For you to say that this piece of property does not or should not have this tax exposure, and then you go and list the property for $84 million, that, I, I need to be straightforward, is a bit disingenuous to me. That is a bit disingenuous to me. It is no coincidence that this listing is literally on the heels, I'm talking a few days after a private closed door work session where council is considering and contemplating massive uptick in real estate taxes. Furthermore, the green space that is the art park is certainly not generating the true revenue that it could for a piece of parcel that's that close to downtown Charlottesville and in the heart of a 10.2 square mile city. I love the art park. I freaking love the art park. I love concerts at the art park. I love 
going to this place. I love the farmer's market. I love all the value that is, that is contributed and the value proposition that comes with Ix. Ix. In fact, someone said on the I Love Seville network last week that Ix is like the last cool little bit of weird left in Charlottesville. And it's true. And someone else said, oh great, the city is going to turn into uh, expensive housing, condos, breweries, and expensive restaurants. And I'm like, that sounds like Asheville. And it's true. But I, I, I find it disingenuous petitioning tax exposure because it's a charitable park and then clandestine in, in clandestine fashion, listing the property for $84 million. Now, some people have said to me, is that $84 million ludicrous, asinine, obscene, anywhere near the ballpark? And you know what? I've thought about this. It's in the freaking ballpark. It is in the ballpark. Do I think it's going to trade for $84 million? No, but I don't think that $84 million is out is as outlandish as one would think. I just identified a comp in Ivy Square Shopping Center, that's 2.77 acres that traded for 20 million. 2.77 acres. Would you rather have Ivy Square Shopping Center at 20 million, or would you rather have 17.5 acres of Ix Park at, I don't know, you probably could get that between, somewhere between 60 and 85. the opportunistic nature of Ix is way more appealing than Ivy Square Shopping Center at 2.77 acres versus 17 and a half. How about Fashion Scare Mall? Would you rather, like Richard Hewitt paid, R. Hugh, Mr. Richard Hewitt, I watched him on the courthouse steps when he paid, um, when he did that last little uh, uh, auction on the Albemarle County courthouse steps. This, this dude dropped $24,700,000 for Fashion Scare Mall, and he did it, like, in the words of Stuart Scott, as if he was cooler than the other side of the pillow. He had Ray-Ban sunglasses on, a white button-down shirt that was cleanly pressed, a gold tie that glistened as if it was gold bouillon, khakis that were pressed with cuffs right above Italian loafers, he looked like a cool cat. Would you rather have a $24,700,000 fashion scare mall or a X Park somewhere between $60 and $85 million, depending on how good your negotiation skill set is? And we need to realize this. The future of Ix Park, I hate to say this, and we all already know it, but the future of Ix is not a concert venue and an art park. I hate to tell you that. The future of Ix, whether we want to realize this or not, whether we're honest with ourselves or not, is Extremely expensive apartments or condos that for sale that will trade eight hundred thousand to two million dollars per unit. Ix is the last most important undeveloped piece of real estate in the city of Charlottesville, and I and I'm going to cut to the chase one more time as I'm being straightforward and honest on this program. The up zoning push that many in this community have done. There's many in this community that are doing this up zoning push for massive density in the city. And I'm all for housing, and as Neil Williamson says, housing everywhere for everyone. I'm all for it. But the collateral damage of this up zoning push in the city of Charlottesville, I've identified one already. The HOA neighborhoods in the city of Charlottesville, and if you go to I Love Seville Instagram, you'll see many that I rattled off. Huntley, Willoughby, the front part, Cherry Hill, Village Place, Lachlan Hill, part of it, Sunrise Park, 
Brookwood, Fifth and Harris, Longwood Drive, Melbourne Park, Paynes Mill. Those are 11 neighborhoods in the city of Charlottesville that are HOA. Those 11 neighborhoods supersede upzoning changes by government. Those 11 neighborhoods are going to explode in value when this upzoning becomes reality, and it will become reality. They will explode in value because those HOA bylaws and documents supersede what city council is going to put into play. They will enormously uptick in value. So will the HOA neighborhoods in Albemarle County's Urban Ring, Redfields, Mosby Mountain, Oak Hill, Lake Renovia, Mill Creek, Foxcroft, Glenmore, Profit Ridge. They will boom in value because the HOA bylaws protect space and privacy and prevent density. That's one of the aspects, one of the collateral damage aspects, one of the nuanced elements that I've covered very appropriately and intelligently on this network. Another nuanced aspect of what's about to transpire, and get ready, dudes. Get ready. The upzoning potential that's about to transpire makes Ix Park even more valuable. Because it means you can put more beds, roofs, doors on the land to monetize. Put more doors and beds and roofs in some REIT, real estate investment trust, some private equity firm, some deep pocket individual, perhaps a public institution, <clears throat> UVA, sees the enormous potential of what is essentially an undeveloped piece of land that is a four iron from the downtown mall. In conclusion, here's what we have. We have two property owners that are not spring chickens anymore. That are looking for a payday. And there's nothing wrong with that. They bought something on the low. And they're selling it on the high. And these sophisticated owners are reading the political climate of the city. And the political climate of the city is indicating the following. Real estate taxes are going to increase big time to fund school reconfiguration and affordable housing projects. And the political climate is saying up zoning is in the very near future which means the parcel that we own a four iron away from the downtown mall has even more value because you could put more condos, apartments, beds, doors, or roofs on it than ever before. So they list the property. They also see Fashion Square Mall was purchased by Richard Hewitt for just under $25 million. And Fashion Square Mall is not nearly as appealing as Ix. And they also see the UVA Foundation pay $20 million for 2.77 acres we call Ivy Square Shopping Center. And this collision of KPIs, key performance indicators, created a rationale for Kootner and Kajin to list the property. And the only disingenuous thing that they have done, maybe two, 
maybe two disingenuous things. The second one, gray area. The first one, certainly. And the first one is trying to devalue or petition or marginalize tax exposure with this property by leveraging a park as a bait and switch public utility. This is a park, it's for the betterment of Charlottesville. They have concerts and host charity functions. We shouldn't be taxed like this. We're giving this to Charlottesville for goodwill. The second, and I know firsthand, the tenants at Ix found out about this listing when we posted it on the Isle of Seville network. I own a good chunk of the building this show is hosted in and a couple of other properties outside the building. If I'm considering listing any of my holdings, I would certainly, in straightforward fashion, tell my tenants that I'm considering doing this, as opposed to them hearing it third party fashion. Got five states watching us today, Judah. Neil Williamson's exactly right, president of the Free Enterprise Forum. The city of Charlottesville assessor and all assessors must value property tax at 100% market value per state code. And he makes that statement basically saying you can't value the property on its iteration today. You've got to value the property on what it can be and not how it's being utilized today. A couple of other items out of today's notebook, and I'm grateful for you watching us on the I Love Seville show, and I want some closing thoughts when we get there from you, Judah Wickhauer. We have some unfortunate, I don't think unfortunate is the right news. It's still... Like in the words of uh, William Shakespeare, parting is such sweet sorrow. Freestyle it's, is closing its doors. After 26 years in business, the owners, the Cobras, have come to the difficult decision to close their doors, they say. The time is right for, for them to move on to the next chapter of their lives, they say. We'd like to thank all our customers for their loyal patronage, they say. It's been a lot of fun, and we could not have done it without you, they say. They say the store closing is currently scheduled for mid to late March. If you have any gift cards with balances on them, please use them before we close the doors. Should you have any equipment here for service that has not yet been picked up, they encourage you to do so at your earliest convenience. They have a 20% off inventory sale on everything in the store. And if you have questions, to call them, to email them, or to visit them on the store. Freestyle, their tagline indicates, is your source for adrenaline sports. For 26 years, a family has served Central Virginia from an outdoor sports, adrenaline sports, winter sports, summer sports standpoint. And the unfortunate nature of business in 2022 is everything is a freaking commodity. Everything has been commoditized, and it's been commoditized thanks to the internet. What's the opposite of thanks to the internet? Despite the internet? Despite the internet, thank you. Unfortunately, due to the internet. And eventually, as families realized that the commoditized nature of outdoor and adrenaline sports retail business has become a nickel and dime world. 
where margins shrink, where work output increases, and where take-home pay is diminished. So that's some new breaking news for you. Freestyle closing its doors after 26 years of proudly serving this community. Another piece of news that I found compelling. Great Harvest Bakery is for sale. Great Harvest Bakery is located in the, that the Woodard Eclectic Shops behind Seville Coffee. The asking price is, I think, I gotta be straightforward, is substantial. It's $225,000. Gross revenue is $552,000 annually. I don't see how that asking is justified. That's just me. $225,000 sales price for Great Harvest. You are not buying the building. You are not buying the building. You are buying the opportunity to do business there, the goodwill that comes with the brand or the location or the name, and every equipment that you find in the building or in the business. Interestingly, you can change the name from Great Harvest. That surprised me. I thought that was associated with a larger parent company franchise structure. But in the listing, it says you can change the name. The second piece of news that has yet to be reported in this community, Great Harvest Bread Company, the business, not the real estate, for sale, asking price of $225,000, gross revenues of $552,000, cash flow of $46,000 annually. Gosh. You're buying the business and not the real estate. It is a very challenging time to be an entrepreneur. A very challenging time. And we are seeing this with businesses left and right hitting the for sale market. Bounce, play, and create. Himalayan fusion. The Shabin. Iron Poffles and coffee. Hotcakes, Jack Shop Kitchen, Great Harvest Bread Company. Judah, two shot. Please, sir, with power of Judah. Thoughts on anything we've covered today? Uh, I, think the, I think my biggest issue right now is the um, your take on democracy I, I find a little bit uh, off um, I think that uh, Yunkin uh, mandating is uh, I, I don't see that as democratic um, at least not the way that the way that he's accomplished it um, <clears throat> it takes into uh, I think it takes into um, consideration the people that uh, the Republicans uh, one side of, of the issue uh, that may have may have wanted this, but I don't think it took into consideration everybody else. And I think it was exactly the same thing as what uh, as what um, what was previously mandated, just in the other direction. Um, I uh, there are a lot of people that disagree with with this new mandate and I think uh, I think we're all better off with choice not just one segment of the population so just you know basically saying parents can decide what they want to do regardless of what the schools say is I, I feel a, it's not a move in the right direction anything else I think that's uh, a large. That, that's that's what I've got to say. Um, I don't really know much about uh, the uh, uh, the real estate issues, um, but 
$84 million is a lot of money. My response to uh, Judah is, I appreciate Judah Wickhauer very much. He's the director of the show. You know, I have tremendous respect and appreciation for you. My take is 1,663,596 people voted for Glenn Youngkin. Just because they voted for him doesn't give him, doesn't mean that anything that he mandates is democratic. Well, Youngkin hasn't mandated anything. He has, though. Youngkin removed a mandate. He, he hasn't mandated anything. He has mandated, though. No. He removed the mandate. He has not issued a mandate. That's, he removed Northrum's mandate. That's not what I heard. That's not a, we could be arguing schematics there, but he's, he's removed Northrum's mandate. Uh, is what Youngkin has done. But it's an executive order. I don't know if that's... It's different than a mandate. Okay. And my take is 1,663,596 people voted for Yunkin. 1,600,116 people voted for McAuliffe. And, and I mean, that's... Yunkin's platform was 100% associated with returning I don't the have power a, I don't to have, parents. I don't have a problem with that, and I don't... This is what I'm... he campaigned on. <clears throat> And if I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. I, I don't have a problem with him getting rid of the mandate. Uh, but from what I've heard from, from people in the school system, he didn't just get rid of the mask mandate. He made it so that, uh, he made it so that schools could not decide for themselves, could not decide with the teachers and the parents. Well, schools are deciding for themselves. That's why it's going to school board votes. That's why Greene County, in 3-2 fashion, voted yes. That's why Almore County is keeping mask in play. That's why the city of Charlottesville is keeping mask in play. You have school systems that are voting with their boards. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. That they is, will. That is public schools that are doing that. And the reason they have that option is because they also have, there is also a ruling on the books somewhere stating that public schools have to follow the CDC guidelines, which gives them a loophole so that they can decide to follow the CDC guidelines or they can follow what, uh, what Yunkin has, has uh, executive ordered if it's not a mandate. As that leaves them the, the chance to make a decision for themselves where private schools which were not included in the uh, in the ruling on following CDC mandates don't have that loophole and they have to follow that's not true they private schools including Glenn Youngkins where his children go are still mandating masks in schools I, okay if I'm wrong, I, I'm wrong you are here and you know I respect you tremendously Charlottesville Catholic School is having to offer the choice to parents because of funding associated with the Richmond Diocese. The private schools are making this choice. Okay. If you say other they're making that choice. Schools, well, other private schools, which I've identified on this program, are still masking up. Oh, I know. I'm... The, now, you could use this as a cog to your argument that Youngkin is leveraging school funding to make schools adhere to his new policy, and that's legitimate. He is given the perception that if schools do not, if schools do not adhere to his lifting of Northrum's mandate, then they will lose potentially funding from the Commonwealth. And that's a legitimate argument. That is undoubtedly a legitimate argument, an argument that's been presented by his administration. But Yunkin is solely lifting a mandate from Northrum. It's not a mandate over another mandate. If I'm mistaken, then I'm mistaken. I apologize. Um, today was a good show. We're very grateful for everybody that's watched. Vanessa Parkhill, hello. Brennan Purcell, hello. Nicholas Erpy, hello. Brian um, Yeagle on Twitter, as I just indicated, and thank you, Brian. School boards have deciding for themselves all week. He's, he's right. We saw that. Um, it's, we're not close to the finish line on this topic. And as I said, it's going to get more heated and embattled 
before it gets lukewarm and rational. So giddy up. I'm Jerry Mellon for Judah Wick Howard. This is the I Love Seville Show.